Once again, good morning, everyone. Really, I hope that you all are well. I hope that you slept well. And I'm very encouraged by this message, but I'm also very convicted. Um, because I think it's one of those times in life when you start to realize that it's not just taking your time and hoping for the best, but there's actual times in life when you need to start making big choices. And I feel that today is one of those days. Um, once again, I'd like to say thank you so much for welcoming Mario and his family last week. Um, it was just amazing to hear how everybody just pulled in and made sure that there was enough food and, and welcomed them, and it, it was good. Um, for those of you who might have missed it, or I can just sort of give my recap of what I felt that he was trying to share, or that he shared very well, if I can put it that way. He was speaking, he sort of continued on with Luke 11, but his essential message was focusing on the way that we shine our lights according to Luke 11, the way that we live our lives correlates directly to how we perceive Jesus. And the way that he illustrated that was through the alabaster oil and the lady who just poured everything she had over Jesus, just trying to, to bless him with everything that she had. And I felt that there was this beautiful message of how he reminded us that how we see Jesus determines how we act towards Jesus and also into life. But there was something that he sort of mentioned throughout his message that wasn't a key point that for me just really resonated with where I feel that we are and something that um, I think Peter and I also discussed this morning in how we very often are led to do certain things because that's how we're used to doing things. And especially the last couple of months, I've really been thinking about, God, what is it that you want from us? Because it sort of feels like us as a church are gaining traction, but at the same time, I also feel that there's been more resistance from, from various places, if you will. So, God, what is it that you want from us so that we can make sure that we're going in the right direction? Like, what is it that you really want from us? And I was encouraged by this message because I kept on thinking, God, how, how do we work all these things together? How do we make the right choices? And for me, it sort of reminded me of this theme that has been flowing through the book of Luke, but especially in chapters 11, how something could be right in front of you, but yet we miss it. And I think I've highlighted it quite a few times as we've been sharing messages um, in going through Luke. But I want to just sort of jump in from Luke 11 and how everything sort of comes together. And how Luke does it is he illustrates Jesus going off to pray. And he prays like in solitary over there. But then his disciples come to him and they say, please teach us how to share or please teach us how to pray. And this is a beautiful image of his disciples going to him, seeing that he's doing something, but then requesting him to teach them according to what they see over there. Because they go to Jesus and say, please teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples. Instead of realizing that Jesus wants to do, God Almighty wants to do something in a certain way. And instead of, instead of adapting according to God's will, they are requesting, or, although it would be in a good heart, God, please come to us in the way that we want and the way that we understand. And yet, God does what he does so beautifully. He's, he says, okay, fine. This is how you pray. And then he taught them according to their understanding. But we need to see that very often God teaches us in a way that is not always so clear. Because directly after that, we see him healing someone who was possessed by a demon. He got rid of the demon. He exercised it. And then people were immediately saying, no, but that's not God. That's of the devil. And Jesus' response was like, he, he made this beautiful thing that we've heard so many times. But a house divided in itself cannot stand which is one of the reasons why we also want to do the starting point course at the end of the month to make sure that we're united, which is why we also discussed the other things that we did regarding Connect Group and just making sure that we have unity and not people pulling in different directions. Our whole heart is to see, God, what is it that you want from us so that we can make sure that this is an important thing and not just socializing. Like, how can we build? This is our main heart. Like, God, I really want to move forward and not just be happy where I am. And we see Jesus giving this explanation of a house divided against itself cannot stand because people were saying it's of the devil. Despite the fact that the sign that he was giving that he's not of the devil is the fact that he just exercised a demon because why would you get rid of your own thing? It doesn't make sense. 
But then the people asked, can you please give us a sign? And I'm thinking, well, just demon going away, that was sort of your sign. Like, that was, like, how you're getting into it. And Jesus' response was, as Mario mentioned last week, so beautifully was, the only sign I'm giving you is the same as Jonah. Essentially meaning my death, burial, and resurrection. In the same way Jonah was in the whale or the fish, same thing, for um, three days and then being resurrected out of the well. That's going to be your sign. So Jesus' response was, the only sign that I'm really going to give you, the truest sign that you can't deny, is the fact that I'm going to die, be raised again. That's your sign. But then there's something beautiful in what proceeds after that that I want to focus on. He doesn't just stop there. He says the only sign I'm going to give you is the death and resurrection, essentially. But then he starts speaking about us shining our lights. And Mario made this very clear, and I, I stand in agreement with him. If we truly understand the sign and understand who Jesus is, then we will shine our lights. But I feel that there's room to interpret that the additional sign is us actually living and shining the, that light. If we truly shine our Christian lights, if we truly live that Christian life, that serves as another sign for unbelievers to understand that Jesus is real. But there's two sets of contrast that sort of continues in this text that I want to read today. And I'm, I'm reading from my Bible, and I want to encourage you to also open up yours and see differences and things. And, and open up your Bibles at, at Luke 11, and we're starting from verse 33. And it's a long passage, and I'm going to be skipping certain sections just, just for clarity's sake. And I want to encourage you to also read this at home by yourself. But if we start reading from Luke 11, verse 33... Um, this is something that Mario touched on last week, but I want to lay or use as the foundation of what Mario mentioned and build on top of that. Not replace, build on top of. No one, when he has lit a candle, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a candlestick so that those who may come in may see the light. The eye is the lamp of the body. Therefore, your eye is good. If your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is also full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, lest your body, which is in you, is in darkness. If your whole body is then, then it is full. Um, if your whole body then is full of light, no being part of the dark, then the whole body will be full of light. And when the shining of the candle gives you light, so essentially he's saying, if you have Jesus' light in you, you will live a light life. And that's important for us to understand because we're going to come back to that a bit later on. But then, and here comes the contrast, because now Jesus is essentially telling us that we need to live a life so that people can see that we're living the Christian life, essentially. You understand? Everyone's still with me. But as he spoke, a Pharisee asked him, there's always one guy, there's always one guy who wants to complain. A Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So now this person is inviting Jesus and what does Jesus do? He tells him, no, you're a Pharisee, get away from me. No, he entertains him and he says, yes, I'll come. So when he went in and sat down to eat, when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And no way should we believe that this is Jesus' teaching that we shouldn't wash our hands before dinner. But what we should realize is Jesus has a way of working in our lives in the exact way that provokes us the most. I firmly believe if he had visited someone else's house, he would have done something different to provoke him to start asking and questioning. I might be wrong, but this is my interpretation of how I see God and Jesus working in the lives of people. He goes to them and he works in our lives in the way that we need it most. In the same way that we always joke and we say, don't ask for patience because because God will give you people to test your patience. That's something that we just need to understand, that sometimes God works in a way that we need Him to, to bring out that, I don't want to say that spirit, but just that part of us that wants to question who God is. And then Jesus goes full on into a preach, loving it. Now, you Pharisees, and now He's speaking to everyone, because He knows that this is what everyone is thinking. Clean the outside of the cup and wash the dish, uh, and wash the dish. But the inside, you are full of extortion and wickedness. He's telling them, you are clean on the outside. You you pretend to wash the dish on the outside, but not the not the inside. 
all of us has, at some stage or another, helped someone wash the dishes and you realize that the person cleaned it on the inside, but then the outside, usually with a pan. There's always some dirt still on the outside, but this is the, this is the, out, the other way around. Like the person cleaned the outside, but inside it's still dirty. And he says, you fools, did you not... Did not he who made the outside also make the inside? But give alms, it means give your offerings, also from what is within. And then all things will be clean to you. Jesus is saying that what comes out from the inside, your, your personal being, where the light originates, that's what's important. That's what makes you clean. And he says, woe to you. He says, be careful, Pharisees. For you tithe mint and rue and every herb and, and pass over the justice and love of God. He's telling them, you guys pretentiously tithe of mint and everything that you have, 10% of everything that you have, you're giving to God. But yet you don't have the justice and love of God. See this contrast again. There's a justice and the love of God. In the same way, God wants us to shine the light, but when we shine the light, it needs to come from inside. Not just a pretentious other people can see it on the outside. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the prominent seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, scribes, and then he carries on to the scribes, the people just helping them, and the Pharisees. You hypocrites, for you are like unseen graves, and men who walk over them are not aware of them. Suddenly I don't see that Jesus picture that we have of him walking with a lamarki with a little sheep and then he's saying the children should come. I see him in this anger moment, this frustration, just saying, can't you just be righteous? Be true to who you should be. He's telling them they're, they're the equivalent of unseen graves. Now for them, just to sort of give context, when you had a grave, the one thing that you had to do is you had to mark a grave. You can't have an unmarked grave because you're not allowed to touch a body or a grave because that would make you unclean. And that wasn't because it, as we see in Romans, the idea between the reason for all these mosaic laws, if you will, was to highlight how quickly we can become unclean. So that was the reason for all these laws that we see very clearly in the book of Romans. But now he's saying you're these unseen graves where people just walk over you or they're close to you or they even touch you and that makes them unclean as well. And if we start thinking about our lives today, if I start thinking about just frustrations that have cropped up recently where I've seen people flock to these types of Pharisees when they watch too much Christian TV and I'm sure that there are good things out there, but the majority of it is always prosperity gospel. Send me your money and I'll make sure that God blesses you. Make sure that you pray in this way and then the demon will be gone if you buy this course book for 500 US. You know, that type of thing. And I feel that there's these Pharisees still amongst us, people who are sharing and unfortunately sometimes even leading churches that unknowingly pretend unknowingly to be the light, but yet inside they're full of darkness. Un underneath all of what you see, there's this darkness. And generally, it sounds horrible, but when Christianity is too beautiful, too, too wonderful, and too great, unfortunately, it's not always true. They're saying, Johan, you can't say Christianity is not true, it's beautiful. No, but when it starts telling you that life is going to be perfect, and everything in this life is just going to be great, it's just not biblical. But people flock to this because they want hope. But the problem is we shouldn't want hope for now. We should want hope for the afterlife. It's essentially the same as that example that I always give about holidays. When you're going on a plane, you shouldn't just hope for that good seat on the plane. You should hope for the upgrade when you get there. Because you might have a very comfortable seat to hell. And that's what people sometimes do. I heard the statistics again this week about how churches have moved away from going into Africa and trying to share the gospel, where now every dollar that is being spent, for example, to share the gospel, five dollars are being spent for humanitarian relief, which is essentially sending people to hell fully fed. I'm not saying that we should neglect these things as we see in the book of James, like we should help people and we should... We should Help them humanitarily, but let us never ever lose focus of why we're here. Let us never lose focus of the fact that we as Christians are called to save people to heaven. Not to tell them they'll be able to pay their rent. 
That's God's job. He will provide, but every now and again, maybe He won't. Because maybe you've got a pride issue. Maybe you're not handling your finances well. Maybe He wants to take you, take you through a season. I don't know. I'm also not saying that everything bad in your life is because God wants to teach you a lesson. Sometimes you just make sucky choices. I'm, I'm ahead of the queue. But there's something there that we need to see between that contrast between shining our lights and actually understanding what that light means. But then generally when you start sharing the truth in one direction, there's always someone on that side also just hearing it, but also wanting to find a fence. One. There's always one guy. One of the lawyers answered, Teacher, by saying these things you incite, you insult us also. There's always that one guy who always gets insulted. Woe to you, and then Jesus carries on to him. Woe to you also, you lawyers, for you load men with burdens difficult to carry, and yet yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. You're telling people to do stuff that you won't even do yourself. We see this with church leaders, and we see this with Christians, telling people to have patience and love, but yet they refuse to allow people into their homes. Yet they refuse to have patience. Yes, you should do this, but yet we don't. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. Your witnesses. Now this, contextually, he's essentially going to say, you are profiteering and you are making money despite the fact that you're making money from the tombs that your fathers killed, which means you're condoning what they did and you're profiteering from it. It's essentially what he's saying. So you are witnessed and entirely approved the deeds of your fathers because they killed them and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them will they kill and persecute, that the blood of all prophets shed since the beginning of the world may be required from this generation, from Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it shall be required from this generation. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge and you do not enter yourselves and hinder those who were entering. There are so many people who righteously think that they are truly helping people, but yet all they're doing is taking away hope. They're taking away knowledge because they're trying to give a hope that is false. I was speaking to someone, I think it was two weeks ago, and they were essentially saying that I was taking away hope in speaking about what we believe in the Bible, because I said, as much as we want to live a wonderful life in this life, and as much as God loves us, truly He does, He doesn't promise us that everything will be perfect in this life. And to believe so is a false truth. And the response to me was, you'll never take away my hope. And all I'm thinking is, the hope that you're believing in is essentially the hope of me telling you, let's go to Port Alfred and have a meal at McDonald's. You can be as excited as you can be. You can enjoy the trip over there as much as you want to. But at this stage, there's no McDonald's waiting for you there. I'm not taking away your hope. I'm helping you realize that there's no McDonald's there. I just want to share truth. It's not the truth that I want. I'm also not condoning McDonald's. We're not sponsored. Follow me for more tips. But I really want us to understand that when we start looking at the Bible, we want truth. That's all I want. I want truth. And in that, I want to start living that life because I'm not happy with living a mediocre Christianity anymore and I'm not happy with leading a mediocre church and I'm not saying that you are, but all of us, to some degree, have this, but this is good enough mentality. And I feel that God wants to break that down. He wants us to flourish. He wants us to have more of all the promises that He, that he gave us. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees begin to, began to incite him vehemently and angry draw him out concerning many things. And now everyone's bickering, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch out something of his mouth that they might accuse him of. So even though you've got a whole group of people trying to just entice him, say something wrong, they couldn't find something. That says a lot, especially while you're insulting people. I think we sometimes forget that. People are getting insulted, but yet they know that he's right. And our many messages end there and we say we should live a Christian life. And that's beautiful. But I felt God wanting us to carry on. So we're going on in Luke 12. Meanwhile, when thousands of the crowd were assembled 
so as to trample on one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So he's essentially saying, Beware of hypocrisy, as you're seeing in the scribes or, and the Pharisees. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, what you have said in darkness will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in the ear in private rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. That's a scary thought. Remember that thing that you told your partner or your friend at the bride softly like this? I firmly believe that there's a part of eternity that's going to be that point where we're standing in front of God and everything you ever did will be revealed in front of everyone. Not to make us feel ashamed, but to help us realize what we were saved of. There's a difference. People hear these types of things. Oh no, what a good God would do that. Because when we start to realize what we're saved from and how evil we can be in our private places, that's when we start realizing your God's grace. Even despite the fact that he knew that, he was still there on the cross saying, forgive them because they're too ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. There's something there. He's saying, stop being hypocrite. Why? Because you're scared of what people will say, so you're whispering. And then Jesus continues. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who will kill your body and after that can do no more. But I warn you, whom you shall fear. Fear him who after he has killed has the power to cast into hell. That's a scary thought. Jesus is explicitly saying that we should have a righteous fear of God. But don't just wait. It doesn't end there. Yes, I say to you, fear him, just in case you missed it. And then Jesus does something beautiful. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. You just told me to be scared of God, and now you're transitioning about how much he loves us. Indeed, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Therefore, do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Sparrows. There's this contrast constantly. God wants us to shine the light, but it needs to come from within. He wants us to fear God, but at the same time know that He loves us. There's something beautiful there. And the moment we start getting those balance wrong, then we either become a, a very eager, trying to be a Jew, or we're trying to be a hyper grace where I can do whatever I want and God just loves me. Because I'm either trying to work for salvation myself through everything that I'm doing and washing my hands and not doing stuff. Or I can live the life that Christ Christianity is very famous for these days. Well, God just loves you. Did you once, when you were at camp, when you were 16, say, Jesus, I want you because you love the atmosphere? Yes, then you're saved. People are going to hell with that false expectation. Why? Because Christians share that. And I was thinking about this message and trying to figure out what to do and what not to do and whether I should actually continue reading this passage because I want to finish this whole section. I'm going to read it. I wasn't going to because I don't want to start more questions than I want to start answering. Jesus continues the section and he ends it off by saying, I say to you, whoever conf confesses me before men, the Son of Man will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Saying, yo, like I've done that, like I've, I've been quiet, like I haven't confessed Jesus in front of people. Like I've been quiet, like I've been reserved. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. So if you're speaking evil against Jesus, then you'll be forgiven. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And some of you are going to pause right there for the next year. What does that mean? The context here, God was doing something in their lives. Their response was, that's of Satan. Now, I don't believe that the God, as I see in the Bible as a whole, will suddenly condemn all those people because they had a misunderstanding or because they were ignorant. What I read in the Bible is the moment you have a conviction and you wonder, you're safe. Like, I can't stress that enough. If you still have a yearning to still want God, you're safe. Because as we see in the book of Romans very clearly, like there's a certain point if people continue sinning where he just allows them and say, okay, fine. Just carry on. 
we've all been there at some stage where you tell someone, don't do it, don't do it, especially parents, and then eventually, okay, do it and see what happens. Just do not that. And that's what Roman teaches. There's a point in time where Jesus speaks about homosexuals and people just doing things where, where Paul writes and he says, they, they're ignoring what they should be doing. He says, the women are being with the woman and the men are being with the woman and God's just saying, well, listen, just do what you want to. I'm just letting you go. Like I'm taking away that conviction. The moment you still have that conviction, God's not done. That's important to realize. What I feel this is referring to is the same if we link this, for example, to a passage in Hebrews. If we know and if we see and if we have all the evidence and we willfully say, that's not of God, I'm ignoring and I don't want forgiveness, then God's will, I can't save you. I can't forgive you if you don't want to be forgiven. If God is working in your life and you know it, because I don't feel that God does something when we're in ignorance. If you know that this is what you're doing, as these people were clearly seeing Jesus, they were seeing God at hand and they were just saying no. Willfully, there's people who are ignorant and I feel that they can still be saved. But there are people who willfully say, God, I don't want to. And I've had type of discussions with people where you can realize you can give them all the scientific and historical evidence in the world that Jesus lived, he died. Or even looking at creation, you can give them all the evidence in the world. They still won't believe because they have a heart issue, not a mind issue. Because very often people say, but how can a loving God send people to hell? He's not sending you to hell. He's trying to save you, but you're sending yourself to hell. So it becomes a heart issue. And that's what Jesus is going against. When they bring you, and then he speaks about to his disciples, and he says, when they bring you to synagogues and rulers and authorities, do not be anxious, for you will answer, don't be anxious about what you will answer or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you that time what you should say. So there he's speaking a bit more to the, to the disciples. He's speaking specifically to them. But there's also wisdom in that and how the Holy Spirit can lead us and strengthen us. And I was thinking of ending that message there. And it's beautiful. It's a strong message. Yes, we need to live for Jesus and don't be hypocrites. But then there's something that I really want to share in love. Are we really Christians shining our light? Are we really? And I, I've spoken about this before of how we sometimes get desensitized about things that happen. You know, from, from a kid, you, you shine this, you know, I'm, I'm going to let it shine and all those songs and, and you think it. And for us in Christianity today, shining Jesus' is light and being a Christian means the reduction of sin in my life. Isn't that what we really think? Like I'm living a better life. Jesus, I'm praying more. I'm shining my light. Or is, that essential, or is that essentially us being Christians or lights under a bucket? Because I'm praying more in secret in my house. I'm reducing my sin. I've stopped watching pornography or I've stopped this addiction. Or I've reduced my drinking in private. That's essentially us shining our lights under a bucket. And now I want to pose this question and I share it in so much love as I can. Are we really shining Jesus' light out there when we can't even pray together here? I've thought about it because some stage ago we started praying before the service and people were praying here and there and people, it, it was good. But I really want to share in love, when we pray together, don't tell me there's not one thing that you can think of. Not one thing that you need prayer for. So I want to end today after we have communion. I want us to have time for testimony, time for prayer, collective prayer. You don't need to tell me you beat your wife five times. You just say, God, help me have patience. Help me be a better husband. Like, don't get stuck on the details. But let's be honest amongst one another. That's the church. The best explanation of what the church is I heard on Sunday in Jeffreys at, at um, Oxygen Life there, where they were explicitly saying that Sunday is the celebration of what it is that we believe as Christians. This is not church. Church is going to connect group and having a bride together and having communion together when you're not at church. That's what true Christianity is about. And don't let this be a heavy message. Let's realize, okay, sure, I've been doing life this way for so long. So there's certain things that you're used to because this is what the church taught us. This is what your dominion and your this whatever taught you for 20 years. And 
I'm not talking about this or that, but we need to realize that just because we've been doing things a certain way doesn't mean that that's how it should be. The way that we should do life is according to this. As I close off, I want to sort of end off on a message I was sharing with someone about our Christianity and church. And she said, no, but we can't join this church because this church is doing this and this church is doing this and they're fighting. So, so we can't do this because of what they're doing, about what culture is doing. And all I, was kept, all I was thinking and responding was, culture doesn't determine what we as a church should do. We should determine what the world should do according to what Scripture says. So because we're doing life and church a certain way, doesn't make it right. We should look at the book of Acts. What do those Christians do? The people directly after Jesus, the people coming to faith. They were connecting in one another's homes. They were expecting miracles. They were bringing prophecy. Everyone came, to with, came together with a word and a song, and these sound like Christianese words, but let's stop thinking that only Johan or the Domini or the elder or whoever can do something. When we pray together, just lay it on your heart. Final message, then I'm really done. Because I want to use this as an example, or two examples actually. We hear these words in the Christian, he's saying, you know, but I felt God saying this to me, or I had this image of something happening. I had the same thing the other day while I was washing dishes and thinking about this message. Now, I can either put it in Christianese, which I think we should to a certain extent. I was washing dishes, and then I saw this image, or I had this thought, or I can say, I was thinking about the message, and this very random idea popped, in, popped into my head that matches, and I feel that it is confirmed of God. There's a difference. Because we sometimes think it needs to be this huge neon sign and everything falls away, flat on your face, and then you see this book here and this. No. Who here has ever walked into a room and when you got there, you've forgotten why you're there? Okay, you don't have to say mama. It's like... But all of us has been there. Like, I've done it. Like, I've opened up WhatsApp to send a message that's an urgent message, and I would see another notification, and then I get lost. And I get confused. And I can't help but think that this is what we're doing in our Christian walk. Like, we became Christians. We're very excited. We walk into the room. Why am I here again? And we don't do it intentionally. We get distracted. We get used to doing things a certain way. But like, yesterday we were... The final illustration, we were at a restaurant there, Chili's at the place that we're thinking of maybe moving the location of where we gather, and we ordered food for us, and we also ordered something for Gabby because it's a day out, let's order, it was like two pancakes with banana and caramel, like she loves banana, she loves pancakes, and she loves caramel, well she hasn't really had caramel ever, but she loves sweet things, she's a child, and we thought, listen, let's just spoil it, let's forget about a proper lunch, let her enjoy this, and at one stage, we were literally, and I'm not, don't judge. Like, please don't judge. We were literally trying to bribe her that we will give you ice cream if you just taste this. It's brunette. We literally had to bribe, and we did not succeed, a two-year-old in trying to taste a dessert thing with another dessert thing so that she would at least try it. And this morning, I'm standing at the front here, and I feel like I'm begging us as a church Try the full Christian life and not just staying hungry on this side. Just because it's new doesn't mean that it's bad. The full Christian life is the equivalent of this caramel infested banana pudding if you have the opportunity to actually taste it. But some of us will go to heaven and we'll have the cheap seats because we were too scared of trying full Christianity a really committed life. So with that, I want to ask that we, I'm going to close with prayer, then I want us to get something for communion, come back, and then I want us to pray together. If you don't have something, find it. Don't tell me you don't have anything. And if you feel God laying something on your heart, say, Johan, I want something to share. I feel that you were wrong. Or, church, I feel that he was right. Or whatever. But let's start communicating together as a church. And not let this be this formal gathering where only your hands are allowed to say something and let us be scared. No. This is the one place where we can share and pray together, where we can stand together in faith. Let's close our eyes and pray. Dear Lord, I want to say thank you so much for this message. Thank you for what you've laid on my heart, Lord. 
I ask that you please open up our minds, open up our spirits and our, our thoughts and our default positions, Lord, and help us experience you more. Help us want more of you, Lord. Help us truly shine our lights and not think that shining our light means to be a better Christian at home, Lord. Encourage us in your word, Lord. I thank you for those who are here, Lord, and I pray for those who couldn't be here. But I please pray that you speak to us in this time, Lord. Amen.